us a great glimpse of a never changing God. I need to let you go 
Hey, somebody this last week sent me this great story about a young, arrogant DEA agent. And he was going out on a ranch in West Texas, and he faced the rancher and he said, look, uh, I'm going to look for illegally grown drugs on your property. We've had reports that that's happening. And the rancher said, well, hey, you know, I'm not aware of it, but, you know, go ahead and check. I'm fine with that. And uh, he said, but there's one pasture that I can't let you go in. You just can't check that one. You can go everywhere else on the ranch, but this one pasture. And it just made that young DEA agent just so angry, he just exploded on him, pulled out his badge. He said, you see this? You know what this represents? This represents the federal government. He said, this badge gives me the authority to do anything I want, anywhere I want, to practically anyone I want. Do you understand the power of the badge? The man said, yeah, I do. Go ahead, help yourself. A little later, the rancher hears that DEA agent screaming and running, and he looks, and this big bull is chasing the DEA agent across that pasture. And the rancher yells at him, hey, show him your badge. <laughs> I like that, right? This morning, we're talking about arrogance. We're talking about pride. And probably nothing in the world has done more to drive people out of church and away from God and has separated friendships and relationships and has damaged business partnerships any more than arrogance and pride. Now, it's terrible in context of Christianity because it is sad to see a humble Savior and a proud sinner. And pride is so pervasive, right? We all deal with it. I struggle with it. You struggle with it. It's never something, honestly, that we ever effectively master every day of our life. We're, we're going to have good days and bad. We're going to go two steps forward and three back. It's because you and I have an old, sinful nature in our life, and our old nature thrives on pride. But it is one of those sins that we have in our life that will keep us from experiencing God's best. It keeps us separated from his favor and blessing on our lives. You see, all of us, if you think about it, all of us in the room, we have certain sins that we like and we have certain sins that we dislike. Now, let's be honest, don't we? I mean, it is easier for me to look at someone else and maximize their sin if it's something that I don't struggle with. Now, I don't know if you're that way. I hear about people and they have certain issues in their life and I just go, how in the world could anybody be into that? That's horrible. That's terrible. I cannot believe that. You know why I have such a bad opinion of that sin? It's because I'm not into that. <laughs> I don't struggle with that. I'm not even tempted in that area of my life. Now, I tend to maximize the things that I dislike. And you know what I also do? I tend to minimize the things that I do like. And so that, that's where pride is so pervasive. And that's where we have to be careful because the devil is so seductive that he can use these elements in our life to just draw us uh, farther and farther away from God. Now, the bottom line is this. All sin is against God. There, there, there's no such thing as big sins, little sins, skinny sins, fat sins. Sin is sin, right? Sin is something that separates us from God. Now, there are not degrees of sin. There are degrees of punishment. You read Romans 2, 5. The Bible teaches a principle that God will deal with certain sins in a, a more strict or harsh way than other sins. Um, like if you steal a piece of gum... That's not going to be nearly as severe of a punishment as if you knock over a 7-Eleven. You know what I'm saying? I mean, both is wrong. I mean, you can't justify either one. But there is a degree to which God will deal with those particular sins. So while there are not degrees of sin, there are degrees of, of punishment. And this thing I'm talking about this morning, in God's eyes, is something that he absolutely hates. Now, when we titled the series this way, we did so kind of to, to be shocking and provocative in your thinking because most people consider God in terms of being loving, and he is. We consider God in terms of um, 1 John 4, 6, uh, God is love, and he is. God loves people. God loves the world, John three sixteen. But it's because his love is perfect that it demands that there are some things that he hates. 
Perfect love will produce perfect hate. Let me give it to you another way. If you love your children, you will hate anything that harms your kids. Is that, is that true? I mean, if you genuinely love your kids, anything that would hurt your kids, it's not too strong of a statement to say, I would hate anything that would hurt my kids, my grandkids. If you love your business, you would hate anything that hurt, harms your business. If you love God, you would hate anything that would harm your relationship with God. So in that perfect love, there is also a perfect hate. Now, if you and I, who are sinful, um, if we can agree with that, and if that applies to us, how much more does that apply to our Heavenly Father, who is sinless? In His perfection, there are some things that He absolutely hates. In fact, he's given us several verses to consider, and this morning, for time's sake, we're going to look at one narrative in in, uh, Proverbs 6. If you have a Bible, look there. If not, take a look at the screen. Solomon wrote, verse 16, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, is it six or seven? Well, there is a uh, literary technique that the writer is using here that is commonly used in Hebrew. It's called numerical laddering, numerical laddering. And all that means is, that literary technique means is, that six is not uh, exclusive. It's six, seven, could be eight, maybe nine. It, It deals not necessarily with the number cumulative as much as it deals with a progression. Here's one, and one leads to two, and two leads to three, and three leads to four, and four to five, and five to six, and six to seven. It's called numerical laddering when you, when you study what that literally is driving at. You see a technique that's often used in the Old Testament in that way. A lot of the writers employ that technique. So don't let that confuse you. In fact, I've studied and found there are some 45 things in the Bible that God specifically says, I hate that. <laughs> don't like that at all. That's not going to hate that. Um, and so in this, he's using this technique that deals with a progression. And it's interesting that he starts the progression, the first rung of the ladder, if you'll notice, is pride. A proud look. Um, the idea is to be haughty, haughty. Um, we use expressions like he's on his high horse, uh, or she's stuck up, or they're looking down their nose at me, right? Right? Those are all expressions to denote someone with an exalted opinion of themselves have now reached a state, a high state, haughty, where they feel qualified to look down at other people. Do you follow that? So here he says, this is a proud look. So the first rung of the ladder is a proud look. And then he gets into a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, hearts that devise wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speak lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. But this morning, let's take the first rung of the ladder. He talks about pride. Consider this with me, pride as it is concealed, first of all. Pride as it is concealed. It is a heart issue. That's why it's so difficult to see oftentimes. That's why it is hard to deal with oftentimes because it is concealed. Uh, Pride is within all of us, as I said a moment ago. We we all have an element of pride. Now understand, there is a good quality to this as well as a bad quality. This is where it gets confusing. Um, There's good pride. Pride in your work. Pride in your family. Uh, Paul said, if I glory, I glory in the cross, being proud that of what God has done in your life, of what he's doing in your life. That's good stuff. That, that, that's a pride that is healthy. That is a pride that does not cause me to be condescending. That is a pride that says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I know I am where I am because of God's goodness and favor in my life, and I'm proud of what he's done. That's good pride. It's a pride that says, I am proud of my kids and what God is doing in and through their life, and thank God they're doing well. Proud of my grandkids and seeing them grow and healthy and all. That's that's good stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. Where you get to the tipping point where good pride becomes bad pride is when you exclude God. Give you an illustration. Herod, in uh, Acts chapter 12, he had beheaded James, imprisoned uh, Simon Peter, and he went out before the people, and he was dressed in this beautiful, um, ornate uh, 
suit, robe, it had these silver medallions all over it, literally covered, so that when the sun reflected off of him as he gave this speech up on this balcony area, uh, he, he literally just, it was difficult to look at him. He was just re- being reflected off the sun. He just like he, he was, this, this uh, glow was emanating from him. And he gave this incredible oratory. Uh, Herod gave this amazing speech before the people. And the people responded and said, that's not the voice of a man We've just heard the voice of God. Oh, Herod said, I like that. God? I mean, that sounds pretty good. And in that shining moment, pardon the pun, God actually used Herod before the people in a powerful way. But when you read the record, here's what happened. Herod did not deflect the glory to God. He took it on himself. He did not say, uh, I'm a sinful man, but God has used me for a brief moment in time to touch your life in some meaningful way. And if there's any glory here, all of this glory goes to God. He didn't recognize God can draw straight lines with crooked sticks. (laughs) He doesn't do any of that. You know what instead he does? He goes, yeah, it is about me. You're right. Enough about me. You talk about me. Uh, So he's taking all that on himself. You know what happens? God killed him. He took him out. He had a, an angel sharpshooter take him down, loosely translated. He literally took Herod out. Herod dies on the spot. Why? Because the principle was God would not share that which belongs to him alone with anyone else. So what happens when the tipping point uh, of pride, good pride becomes bad pride? It's when we fail to recognize that all that we are and all that we have and all that we ever hope to be, we owe to him. So whatever glory or fame or success that I enjoy in my life as a Christ follower, the first one I am to give thanks and glory to is God. What that does, it keeps you humble, which is the exact opposite of pride. And so this pride concealed is within our hearts. It was within the heart of Herod. In fact, um, when you read the, the Old Testament book Obadiah, Now, that's back there where all the pages are stuck together in your Bible. (laughs) But when you find it and read Obadiah, you'll find an interesting story. The posterity of of Esau were called the Edomites. And the Edomites had rebelled against God, and they had built their fortress in the high parts of the rocks. It's in an ancient place now known as Petra, if you're familiar with that part of the world. And they had built their habitation in Petra, in the high parts of the rocks. And what they would do is when an enemy would approach, it was an easy place to defend because they'd just push rocks off on their enemies. (laughs) You didn't need to spend any bullets. You didn't need to expend any arrows. You just push a rock. And they couldn't get to them because, you know, they were, it was that fortified cliff with a very narrow passageway, one way in, one way out. And so the Edomites had, had actually built their cities up in the cliffs of those rocks. And it's interesting because in in their journey, they became more and more wicked, more and more arrogant, more and more proud and full of themselves uh, to the extent that they said, we don't need God. We're doing fine without him. We can protect ourselves. And when you read, it's interesting, you read Obadiah chapter one, verse three, God says to the Edomites, he says, even if it were possible, for you to build your dwelling in the stars. Now think about that. If it were possible for you to have a habitation in the stars, God said, from there, I can bring you down. God says, you can't get so far that I can't reach you. Are you kidding me? You you can't go so far. You can't get so big that I can't deflate you. you. You can't get so huge that I can't deal with you. There's no one too difficult for God. And yet their pride had given them a false sense of security, and they began to really believe they were fine without him. So I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be careful today, not that we're going to build a fortress at Petra, or or, or not that we're going to give some big oratory and people are going to shout, you're the voice of a God and not a man. That may not be our issue. Our issue this morning might simply be that we're going to have levels and measures of success in our life where we seem to think it's about us and no longer about him. Joe Gregory uh, talks about a barnyard tragedy. He said the rooster 
on the farm, when the sun would come up, would crow and would wake the farmer and his wife and all the family up, and the farm would come to life right after sunup because the rooster would crow and awaken them. He said before long, the rooster got into some foul logic in thinking that because he crowed, the sun came up. He forgot the fact that he crow, that, that, that the sun didn't come up because he crowed. He crowed because the sun came up. But he felt the pressure. If I don't get up, the sun won't come up. So I have to get to bed early. I have to make sure I'm up because the sun won't come up if I don't get up. And so I have to crow. And it wasn't long until the rooster was having all kinds of nervous problems. He was, he was struggling with insomnia. Because he felt like the whole farm depended on him, and all the animals were counting on him, and the success of the farmer was based on him. If I don't get up, the sun won't come up. And he said, finally, the rooster had a breakdown, and they had to put him in a nervous home for roosters. It's the barnyard tragedy. Can I tell you, a lot of people have that mistaken idea of our own self-worth, and that's the seductive nature of pride. The devil can use something that is very good in your life and get you to that point where it's a tipping point where that which God was using for good now becomes something that works in you and it's within us, this thing of pride. It's pride concealed. But here's what's inevitable about it. Number two, pride will get revealed. It isn't long until what is in us comes out of us. Um, You know know how it's revealed? It's revealed, first of all, through how, how we talk. If you want to know what someone thinks about, listen to what they talk about. If you really want to know what's in someone's heart and on their mind, what is the preponderance of their communication? What is it that they're drawn to? What is it that they speak most about? The Bible talks about the principle that, in fact, it's Psalm chapter 12, verse 3, that the tongue has an ability to speak arrogant and proud things. Now, why does this tongue speak proud things? because it's in the heart. What's concealed becomes revealed. Uh, Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it isn't long until one who is really struggling with pride and someone who is really a haughty, arrogant person, it isn't long until you'll be able to see that and identify that because it will come out in their communication. Here's another way it is revealed. It is revealed in how they respond to the teaching of God's word. Hmm, interesting. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. It says that when I reject the teaching of God's word and I don't apply it to my life, it is because of pride. So, for example, when someone hears a principle of God's word communicated or taught, and they recognize it as God's word, they know that they need to amend their life to that principle, and they refuse to do it. The Bible says the reason they don't do it is because of pride. So it it is evident. It is revealed in our life through how we speak, through how we respond to Scripture. Here's a third thought. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it it is also revealed in my lack of prayer when I fail to pray. You know what? Failing to pray is, I don't want to guilt trip you on this. I'm just trying to, we're just talking. When I don't pray, I am making a conscious decision not to talk to God. And most of the time when I don't pray, it's because I feel like I can handle what I'm going through. Now now think about, now head, let's go down this road a little bit. Think with me. Usually what, draw, what drives us to our knees And usually what causes us to pray is when we're finally confronted with something that we cannot handle in our own strength. The doctor says, "Um, I've done all I can do. You need to pray. And we go, oh, dear God, are we down to that? (laughs) We don't say that. But you get what I'm saying. So I'm saying typically we, we make it a conscious decision not to pray because and basically what we say when we don't do that is I got this God. I can handle this. I'll bother you when I hit big stuff. This is little stuff. I can handle the little stuff. I, I, I mean, I, I, can, I can do this. And you know what happens? Because the, the number one desire of God, when you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the number one desire of God was to create us so he could have fellowship with us. He walked with Adam in the cool of the day. The desire of God was for you and I to be in a relationship with him. And, and in that relationship, to be in fellowship with him, to communicate with him. 
Now think with me. If God's main desire is to communicate with me, and the way I do that is through prayer, and the way he talks to me is through his word, and yet I'm not really in his word, or if I am, I'm not obedient to his word, and I don't communicate with him, that's not happening. And the only time I do is when I'm in trouble. Then doesn't it stand to reason that if God's main desire is for me to communicate with him, and if it takes trouble for that to happen, that maybe I'm inviting a lot of trouble into my life? God's saying the only time they ever talk to me is when they're in trouble. So because I really want to talk to them, I guess I'm just going to have to keep him in trouble. (laughs) I'm just going to have to keep enough pressure on him so he'll keep talking to me. Now, doesn't it make sense? Maybe a solution for some of us would be, okay, lesson learned. So I'm going to take everything to God in prayer. I'm going to take big things and little things. If there's a principle that I understand in God's word, I'm going to write it down, pray it in, and live it out because I don't want it to require trouble to bring me to a place where I will talk to God and respond to him. So pride is one of those things that keeps us from prayer. It's one of those things that keeps us from being obedient to his word. It's one of those things that affects even the way we talk. Look at Proverbs 13.10. Here's another way it's revealed, contention contention, contentious spirit. Have you ever seen anybody could fight, start a fight in an empty room? I mean, they, they just, they're just angry, hostile. It doesn't take anything to set them off at anybody. They just go around just, just contentious. Well, the Bible says there in Proverbs that that's because they're full of pride. They become so full of themselves that they believe the world revolves around them and they're that important And as a result of that, the Bible says it's revealed through being contentious. They're just angry and hostile. And the root cause here, he says, is is pride. Here's another one. Uh, John 9, 41. Here's another way it's revealed. Self-righteousness. I got into that a minute ago when I was talking about Phariseeism, where you look down at other people. You pontificate. You preach at other people. Uh, Christians can get into this idea that because we are forgiven, now we are qualified to judge other people who may not have experienced that forgiveness. Pharisees were great at that. They knew just enough of the Bible to be dangerous. You know, they'd gotten a subscription to psychology today, and they thought they were now psychologists, and they were ready to evaluate everybody. You know anybody like that? And the point is... um, They had become so arrogant in the way they were treating people that the Bible doesn't say they were righteous. It said they were self-righteous. There's a big difference. Big, big old, big old difference. You read Mark chapter 2 and you have the the going away party of the tax collector and Jesus is sitting there. And like I've told you before, the tax collectors of that day were Jewish people hired by the Roman government to excise taxes from Jewish people because they figured who better to get money out of Jewish people than a Jewish person. And so these guys were crooked. They were, the, they were probably the very first mafia that you ever read about. It was organized crime. And these guys would go to someone who had a tax issue and said, look, you slip me a little money under the table. I'll throw some money at the government. We'll alter your tax record. Everybody makes a little money. And, and you know, nobody's the wiser for it. And that's how they rolled. That's how they operated. And the Romans knew they were dishonest, and the Jewish people knew they were dishonest. They were despised by both groups. But Rome allowed them to operate because they figured, well, a little of something is better than all and nothing, so hey, they are at least getting some taxes out of these people. And the Jewish people said, well, you know, at least I don't have to pay the full amount of the tax. I can pay this guy under the table, and he'll send the rest into the government. And so I'm saying these guys were bad, bad people. And one of those tax collectors came to faith in Jesus. He accepted him as his savior. And he said, I got to get out of the business, man. I got to resign. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep taking advantage of people and be a Christian. I can't do that anymore. So they throw him a party. And guess who's right there in the middle of the party? Jesus. He's right in there in the middle of all that. Can you imagine? Here are the top mafia bosses of the day, and there's Jesus sitting at the table with them. And first of all, it had to freak them out for him to show up. But there he is right there. And guess who wasn't in the room? The self-righteous Pharisee. They're looking through the window, and here's their accusation. Look at him, they said. He is eating and drinking with those sinners. And you almost just see them spit after they said sinners. Just 
Man, I even want that word in their mouth. They're so holy. And Jesus, who was God, perceived their hearts, and he went out and he got in their grill. That means he got in their face. And here's what he said. Listen to this. He said, I did not come to call righteous people to repentance. I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, wait a minute. You know, don't, don't find a tooth now and go build a dinosaur. Here, here's, what, here's what he was saying. He was not saying those guys were righteous. He was, he was saying they're self-righteous. What's the point? Jesus said, I can't help people who don't think they need help. I can't do anything for a self-righteous person. I, I, I mean, I, the, the, what can you do for them? You, even God can't fill what is already full. <laughs> And when they look at him and say, I don't need you. I don't need a savior. I can save myself. I'm good enough. In fact, you, you might need me. They became so full of themselves, so self-righteous. And Jesus confronted them and said, look, if I'm going to hang with anybody, I'm going to hang with the people who know they're messed up. I'm not going to hang with this group that think they're better than everybody else. And I'm just saying that the reason those people are there is because of pride, they're full of pride, and one of the ways it gets revealed is through self-righteousness. And this happens in churches all the time. You almost could see a sign where they say, no shoes, no shirt, no sinners, you know. And they've really forgotten wh where they come from. They've forgotten that the best any of us will ever be in life are sinners saved by grace. And you know what causes people to forget that? It's pride. Just pride. Self-righteousness. Here's the last way it's revealed. The last way it's revealed is through consequences. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, that a person who is full of pride, a person who is haughty, that those things precede destruction. Those things go before a downfall. God is saying, just sit and watch, just wait, be patient. I'll deal with people who are full of pride. And the two words that are interesting there in Proverbs 16, 18 are the words destruction and fall. Those are not happy words. <laughs> Those are very serious words. And God is saying, man, once, you are, once you've had the pride that is concealed, that it, it, it now becomes revealed, he's simply saying, deal with it or I will. Which leads me to my final thought. How is pride repealed? How is it dealt with? Well, first of all, you can't fix what you can't see, right? Right? And so as I said earlier, it's so subtle that it's hard for any of us to see if we're infected with it. So what we have to do is kind of go back to point two and kind of work through the list and say, is pride in my life being revealed in any of these areas? And, and, and the best way to get an honest answer is to ask somebody who loves you the most and knows you the best and, and, and give them permission to tell you the truth now. Don't get mad at them. But just say, I really want to know, are these areas of my life Areas that, that I need to work on, give some attention to. And if you don't go that route, go a different route. Where David said, God, search my heart. See if there's any wicked way. Get alone somewhere with God and say, God, if this is a real issue with me, have I got to the tipping point where instead of recognizing your blessing in my life, I'm now kind of assuming that I've done this without you and I can continue to do it without. Show me that. He will. He'll reveal that to you. And then it's just as simple as 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All confession is, the word means agreement. Agreement, that's it. It's not rocket science. When I confess, I'm just agreeing with God. I'm just saying, God, this thing has become a bad thing. It was a good thing. started out to be a good thing. It's become a bad thing. It's affecting my relationships. It's affecting my family. It's affecting some of my business partnerships. I've got to the tipping point where good pride has really become a bad pride. And it's affecting me and affecting other people. So God, I confess that to you. I agree with you. This isn't good. So Lord, help me to deal with this from this day forward. And let me tell you, it's not a one-time fix for all time. <laughs> this is something guys will have to deal with and struggle with from now on. But once we're aware of it, once we're cognizant of it, we can fix it. With the help of God, we can fix it. Let's pray. Father, this morning we've hit the first rung of the ladder as we've talked about the things that you hate. 
the things that separate us from you, the things that separate us from the people that we love, and those that we've been called to minister to. So help us, Lord, to recognize the devastating and destructive effects of bad pride. Help us, Lord, to recognize and to confess and to forsake some habits, some attitudes that are destructive in our life. But Lord, I pray that you'll also make us aware that we really can't deal with these issues without you. On our own, we might do good for a little while and then we'll slide right back in because we don't have a power within us greater than ourselves. So Lord, I pray for my friends this morning who may never have trusted you. They're good people or they wouldn't be here today. But they've never come to that place in their life where they have said, God, I turn my life over to you and I trust you. Not my religion, but my relationship with you. I pray this morning you'll give them the courage in this room and the closing moments of this service to humble their hearts and be able to say to you through this simple prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin. Be a reality in me. Help me to live the life you've designed me to live. I don't want to miss anything good that you have for me. May that be their prayer. And Father, help us all to recognize the fact you've made us for more than this. You came that we might have life and have it abundantly. So help us, Lord, to recognize the things that could keep us from experiencing that. And God will give you great thanks and will give you great praise. We ask it in Christ's name.